Hello and welcome to Kicking Tires. My name is Jimmy. And I'm Justin. And today we got some exciting automotive news from Toyota, Subaru, Hyundai. I don't know. I mean, there's like five, there's like five different pronunciations. Yeah. Um, but also the AMG GT 63S. But we'll talk about that later. I want to talk about Toyota first because Toyota just talked about how they release their 50 millionth Corolla sold. That's a lot of Corollas. It's a lot of Corollas. I've had, I've had three Corollas. So you're you're a contributor <laughs> to this 50 millionth Corolla sold. Yeah, I was given a Corolla. Actually, oh, so, I was given three Corollas. Oh, okay. So <laughs> none of them you, were mine. <laughs> you don't you don't count towards the sold part. Two were my grandparents, and then one was a customer. Was just like, have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. Have it. Um, yeah. So in Canada, there's 1.6 million of them sold. That's a lot of Corollas here in yeah. Canada. We only but, have 30 some odd million people. So <laughs> that's so, 5% of the population. And of course, this is with the lifetime of the Corolla. So, I mean, I'm yeah. sure a lot of people that once bought one goes back and buys another because they love it so much. No, because they don't break and then you don't have to buy another one. <laughs> that's also true. I remember <laughs> when I first learned to drive, it was in a 95 or 96 Corolla, like special edition mm. with the three speed automatic. And I thought it was the worst thing ever. Three speed with no tachometer. Oh, so that's like the one out. The one I was given was a 99 or 98 VE. Mm. That's a newer with, gen. Um, yeah, newer gen. It's got the pointier headlights. It had no clock in it because it's a VE, had only Ooh. two speakers. Uh, At no least you get tack. two. It had AC because the VE is stands for value. Oh. And so it, you know, people actually want uh, AC. So it had AC and automatic. And that one was actually kind of nice to drive. Uh, not going to lie. It drove okay. Um, the, the ones I learned to drive in were the ninth generation. So an 03 and an 07, both mm. my grandparents, uh, the same car. But one was the first year, one was the last year. <laughs> that was that was like the rounder headlights. That's when they when they, they introduced the matrix, right? The car grew a lot. So it was the gen after this ninety eight one. So uh mm. that's kind of when it became like I don't know, it looked a lot more respectable just because the, the car was a lot taller, a lot wider and like just look more like a real car, whereas the 95 to 99, those those kind of look more, I don't know, you could tell they're they're like very budget conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Corolla, Corolla means a lot, you know, for a lot of us, a lot of us learn to drive in it, whether, you know, it was a family car or it's just what you're driving school. I just did a install this week on a driving school Corolla. Uh, I've done quite a few actually, and they're all Corollas because they put so many they put about 40 to 50,000 at least per year on them so they're great for that and they're still friendly enough to add a second steering column second set of pedals and um so for that reason a lot of us learn to drive in corollas um corolla learning to drive in that so that's the eighth generation i had that one and then i had a ninth ninth generation is what i learned in the ninth gen uh the throttle pedal is very touchy in this mm. car. It's very easy to trip the tires, no traction control. Perfect. Um quite it's peppy. I thought it was it was decent enough to drive. It didn't feel like way underpowered. The car is pretty light, but it did kind of teach you to modulate the throttle a bit. The brakes were not terrible uh by Toyota standards. If you if you've ever driven like a Sienna uh, those were pretty bad brakes, but the Corolla, given the weight, it actually felt okay. So, mm. um, and it's a great car to learn to parallel park in because you still have a good four feet of car behind the rear window, and so it helps for to judge your distance and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's got thick enough tires that it doesn't matter. You can't. You curb won't them. really curb them. <laughs> I mine were pretty bad, so. The 03 had hubcaps, and then the 07 or 08 
uh, that's a special edition, which is always that last model year. Right. Uh, they do the special edition. So it had the sunroof, had the ugliest alloy wheels. Like, I'd rather have the hubcaps. These alloys were so ugly. <laughs> and they, they're they so poorly made that they just pit. Like, all the Toyotas from, like, the 2000s, the wheels just pit like crazy. Like, the mm. paint the paint is so poorly done. I don't think it's meant for Canadian roads. Um <laughs> Didn't think about the salt and whatnot. Yeah, they all like I don't know how aluminum alloy rusts so easily, but <laughs> but it, if you see a rusty wheel from a two thousand, chances are it's from a Toyota. And actually, well, like I, I like the ninth gen because that's when they introduced the uh, the XRS model. Yeah, the interior was, like, is way one. nicer on a ninth gen than yeah. the ones before. Uh, XRS model with a six speed. Yeah, six had a six speed manual and the white gauges, I think. Uh, yeah, both of mine were the base model at the time, so the C, which, which was I had the roll down most of like when you when you see a Corolla is generally the CE model or the VE model or the special edition. But you know what? The other day I actually found on Craigslist a '97 Corolla LE. Mm. It was beautiful with the f- five Low. speed. I think I think it had five speed on five it. Speed manual. Yeah, yeah, with the tack, had AC, a clock, rear door speakers, <laughs> had speakers in the back. I think it even had power windows. Like, yeah, it was loaded. <laughs> yeah, the VE was loaded. Some of the the LEs for the O three had the leather seats too, Oof. and the, the the cheap wood trim. Actually, one of our friends, uh, Candice, had one. The mm. LE was also given to them by another family. <laughs> like they just get handed like that's the beauty of the Corolla, right? There's nothing amazing about the Corolla. Um except for the fact that they, they last forever and they cost nothing to run. And that that's huge. Mm-hmm. Like that's the whole reason cars exist. And so the Corolla as much as I like to hate on it, I understand why for so many of us that's where your automotive journey begins mm-hmm. with the Corolla because Literally, so like the 98, it had some issues with it. I needed to put new shocks on it. Like one headlight was busted, $20 brand new. Shock was like $60 brand new. Um, It's just like stuff like that. Oh, I needed a new spring. Somehow the spring was so rusted. And it was like $30 (laughs) brand new. And it's going to go for another 15 years. That's that's the the beauty of it. Like it's so cheap. Like even if you mark up the the parts 50% it's still it's still cheap uh because they're so abundant but one thing i want to point out is the corolla's changed so much over the years we have here the first gen second gen and they look like little stylish sport coupes it's not the the corollas that your generation or my generation grew up with or our generation i guess i should say <laughs> I, I, I love how you always that. put me in another bracket i love it um but it's not really the Corolla that we're so familiar with. Obviously, we have the initial D Corolla. Uh, yeah, everyone knows about the 86 Corolla. 86, which is still around as an 86. Like, the spiritual successor is still here. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point is the Corolla name has changed a lot. Like, it became a hatchback. It's a notchback. It went from rear-wheel drive to front-wheel drive. And where we're really going with this is that the new Corolla um, yeah. it's now going to the Corolla Cross. We we talked about it before, and the Corolla Cross it it really symbolizes something important, which is the shift of the market demand. Right, the Corolla is the car for the masses. It's it's you know everyone buys them, and doesn't matter how old you are. You know, it's a great first car. It's a great car for retirees. Um, mm-hmm. There's no real demographic necessarily that's why they can sell 50 million of them yeah now with the current corolla the sedan and the hatchback as good as they do look on the outside i think that the new the current gen looks pretty good especially when you oh, get looks SE, aggressive xse yeah uh, both the sedan and hatch obviously the hatch is more stylish um as good as they look, I don't think they perform all that well. They're no. not that powerful, and they're not that great on gas. And their interiors are kind of behind mm-hmm. their competitors, typically. But you don't buy a Corolla because of that. You that's, buy it because... Normal. Yeah, it's always been, like, unexceptional. 
and there's nothing that stands out about it because this is a car to last 10, 15 years, be handed down from generation to generation. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think even now they still are. Um, that's why they're not that exceptional. But the people that understand, okay, I want a practical, reliable, cheap to run, doesn't depreciate that much kind of car, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I again, I talk about having one as a courtesy car twice this year, actually. I had one, both LEs, and they were just pretty awful to drive frankly speaking but you know the cross really symbolizes the the change i think over to a different body style and i think eventually the sedan and the hatch is going to get phased out probably within the next decade or so and we'll just have corolla this is now the The, next generation's corolla Corolla. is going to be a, a small you know compact crossover a little bit smaller than a rav4 Personally, I think I don't know if there's necessarily room for the Corolla Cross in the segment, but um, I see why they need to make this shift, and it it makes sense to bring this name over. So, um, well, it's a household Toyota, name. Toyota's really good at making like a cross version, like an off roady, not off road, just an it's SUV the version. IS three hundred Sport Cross. Oh wait, maybe not that one. <laughs> Of course, they have the RAV4 that we know. They have the CHR, the Corolla Cross, but there's also a Yaris Cross. Um, mm. And the Yaris Cross, of course, slots underneath the uh, Corolla Cross. Like, they they practically want to make a car for everyone. That's really what it comes down to. And uh, for different size of families and whatnot, you might, you might be interested in a Yaris Cross or a Corolla Cross. Um, but I think you, you're, you're absolutely on the point here. Toyota with the Corolla, you know, as we look back in history, it's a huge difference from where it used to be and where it is now. Um, I don't think it's any worse in terms of performance. A lot of people think the 86 um, Corolla is some sort of like God tier level vehicle. It, it truly isn't. Um, <laughs> it doesn't handle well out of the box. No. The 4 AGE is kind of a special engine but not the ones that we got no (laughs) like a lot of people's like oh it was an initial d that thing can be like rx7s yeah rev to eleven thousand r no it doesn't really (laughs) no (laughs) that's in a comic or yeah guy pulls up with r34 gtr (laughs) and tofu boy just yeah that's fine (laughs) i can beat it yeah no it doesn't really happen that way so gotta be honest the 86 while you know, it is a good car and there's a lot of heritage there. Um, it's not as amazing as a lot of people might think. So the the generation gap between them, um, after I think like the 92-ish, where they had that GTS version um, of like the first front wheel drive Corolla, that's kind of when they stopped like a sportier model. Mm-hmm. And then they brought it back with the XRS, but then it died down again. So with the previous generation and the current gen there isn't like a sporty like performance yeah. mind apex edition like they try to spice it up here and there but it looks amazing it just the doesn't, apex yeah it's not what gets enthusiasts going the a6 no. obviously is the uh but that's you know, exactly it's branched it. off that's exactly it you know they take the yeah. a little bit of that subaru money and they make the yeah. 86 and that's going to be their well enthusiast Very, model yeah enthusiast model that it's easily attainable because mm-hmm. 30 grand or so like <laughs> that's the same price as a corolla and mm-hmm. you can walk into a toyota showroom and be like i got 30 grand what am i gonna buy a practical everyday vehicle that's good on gas or am i gonna have more fun so they're giving you these options but they're just not giving it to you under that corolla name that's all yeah so i do expect the corolla going forward maybe in about a decade or so to be an all electric crossover and i think um you know for our generation it's it's very much an appliance type vehicle uh and i think going forward it probably the would be. cross <laughs> is gonna be kind of an appliance too but maybe a little bit more stylish than than the sedan because the sedan really is quite uh I don't know. That Apex Edition looks amazing. It looks it looks decent, but it's it looks like, so good. The the black yeah. arrow bits that they add, 
it it looks really good. It just it doesn't have anything under the hood to back to, it up. To back up the amazing good looks that it has. Yeah, and I mean the Corolla Cross, it kind of has that look uh, that a Corolla should. It looks like it would appeal to you know if you're 18, 19, this is your first car. Maybe parents helping you a little bit with the down payment, get really reasonable bi-weekly lease on this thing. Uh, it looks like the car that could do that. But also, if you're retiree, you occasionally need a backseat for the grandkids. It looks yeah. like it will do the job for that too. And it'll be easy to get in and out of. Yeah. So it's it's such a it's such a car for everyone. Um, I I think that's why Corolla has gone this way. I think that's why the Golf has gone this way. Mm -hmm. Again, another people's car. The Civic, not quite yet, but we're we'll probably will see that very soon too. Honda's really slow. They're, they're really banking on that sedan to work. Their and entire like, model lineup is sad. Yeah, I mean the CRV <laughs> is is getting an update sh very soon, but yeah. uh, the Civic, the Civic brand is still they're they're clinging on to that as the four door sedan primarily. Yeah. Um, um, let's move on because from Toyota, of course, like I said, they did kind of combine their. Uh, their forces a little bit with Subaru and they're making this electric SUV. The Toyota is going to be the BZ4X. The, thank you. I can't BMW remember. BMW Z4 X-Drive. I can't remember. I always remember it. <laughs> but the Subaru version is called the Solet Soltero. Soltero. Sorry. <laughs> so, Sola See, that's one they should Solera. bring back, right? <laughs> so, Solara, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Freudian slip right there. You missed that car so much. You want that sporty convertible? Sporty. <laughs> Sorry, did you say Solara and sporty without a knot in the middle? Um, <laughs> the first gen was semi respectable. <laughs> no, <Okay. laughs> no, the Solara was like the most comfortable two door cruiser that you can buy. Like, yeah. that's all what it was. Yeah, exterior-wise, the Solterra is very similar to the. It it looks Z4X. very similar to the Toyota version. It's kind of like the '86 and the BRZ. It's going to be that kind of partnership. Mm -hmm. um, under the hood, of course, being a full electric SUV, no Boxer engine. So, is this the first Subaru without a Boxer engine? Maybe. Or at least first Subaru in a while without a Boxer engine. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, um, maybe they'll boxer the uh, the electric motors or something. <laughs> it's just, it's just how? I, I don't know how that would work. Put the batteries on the side and motor in the middle. No, put them on cams. The motor is <laughs> like like this and horizontal. <laughs> just the engineering for it, just so that they can have a that they, they can say yeah. that it's a boxer engine, right? It's a boxer. Um, the Elta looks kind of good. Um, from the kind of preview images that we got here, um, it looks basically like a RAV4, mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit kind of coupe esque. Yeah. So, like the back end is chopped off a little bit, uh, but the front and the side is very, very yes. uh, RAV4. And, well, and they've given it Subaru taillights. So, mm -hmm. that's kind of where it differentiates from the Toyota version. Uh, the taillight design is a little bit different. The Toyota one looks more kind of like the Mirai one. Mm. Uh, and then this one looks more like a Crosstrek or an Outback uh, taillight design. But otherwise, it is very similar. Uh, still has that weird cladding that extends forward. Yeah, all the, the way uh, under the headlight. <laughs> yeah, Subaru has always had an awkward relationship with cladding. That might be a good segue into our next story, but um, we'll we'll get there in just a sec. Yeah, because I want to talk about cladding. Um, not that long ago, I think we actually might have talked about this on the podcast. Our favorite cladding, Outback Sport. <laughs> the the one the generation that I had, the STI that I had, yeah, like two thousand nine Outback <laughs> Sport. Not the one the one before kind of had cladding. Yeah, the one before had it. But, but like, if you look up an <laughs> 09 generation Outback Sport, it's yeah. just painted. <laughs> and it's painted a light color. <laughs> so, the, the best cladding that you can ever have. That, yeah. It's the weirdest cladding on any Subaru that I've seen. Yeah, it's just someone masked it and then painted it silver. 
and <laughs> it I... makes it makes no sense. Like from from thirty feet away, you're like oh that thing's got cladding. No, not not even like <laughs> and then up close. You're just like oh they just forgot to paint the bumpers. <laughs> It's like when I first saw that car, I honestly thought that someone was just creating something stylish over an Impreza. I didn't know that was how it came from factory because it looks so different and odd. It's so embarrassing. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's go to the next year, uh, which is Subaru news again. Uh, but Yet it's again. The... <laughs> It's the Forester Wilderness Edition. So have we not talked about this before? We we have <laughs> talked about this. Um, so not that long ago, uh, Car and Driver said that the next uh, Wilderness Edition will be in a Subaru Ascent, and we told them that they were wrong. And last week, I believe we talked about how they accepted the fact that they were wrong. And Subaru Canada leaked images, so, well, accidentally posted some photos of the 2022 Subaru Forester Wilderness. So here's what you need to know. Lifted, body cladding, different wheels with uh, all-terrain tires. There's a few more skip plates underneath. There's stronger roof rails, so you can put a tent on the top. It still has the same 2.5 liter Boxer 4, naturally aspirated with 182 horsepower. Nothing's changed there. Mm -hmm. And the CVT has been revised a little bit so that you get a lower crawl ratio. And that's really it. So we wanted the turbo. We talked about this. We were hoping that wilderness means turbo. It doesn't look like the case, unfortunately. Yeah. I will say one thing is that the we're, we talked about this new facelift on the Forester, how ugh, last week. But in the wilderness spec, admittedly, that facelift looks decent. It's it's okay. I mean, it's, it's the same okay. headlight that we saw in um, the the Jap the Japan one that we uh, we showed last week. Mm -hmm. But like in here, it, it it helps a little bit because of the bumper. I think it's yeah really how the bumper design goes all the way up to the headlight. Yep. That makes it work a little bit more. Yeah. So and another cool thing they've done with the bumpers is that the the corners have shrunken in a little bit especially the lower corner. So that gives you a little bit more approach. Um, so a little bit better off-road performance. I noticed they use, they're use using the Yokohama Geolander AT tires, mm -hmm. same as the Outback Wilderness. Kind of not that cool looking of a tire, in my opinion. Like AT tires, okay, the look matters. And, <laughs> and the, the Yokohamas are just not the best looking. Um, I'm I'm sure there's a reason for it, fuel economy and whatnot. I think it's just supplier stuff, you know. Also, have getting, but they put Falcons on the cross track, like not not all terrains, but they put Falcons. Mm. So they do have a relationship with Falcon, um, and so a Wild Peak Trail, not you know, obviously not the AT3W, but the trails might be a good choice. Um, and then in terms of size, it looks to be roughly the same as the existing Forester. Yeah. So no, you know, it's not like they revised the CVT ratios to compensate for a taller tire. Maybe they expect people to put a taller tire. That might be why they have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe tweak the, is there a final drive? I don't know how CVTs work, frankly. Yeah, there's but, a um, final drive ratio that they tweak. But yeah, if that is the case, that would make sense because they're like, okay, people buying this car, they might upgrade the tires. Now, from a uh, aftermarket perspective, the Forester has not been great for aftermarket tires. Um, the reason there's something about the suspension design when you lift it, the rear tire moves forward, and it just you have to do oh. some weird stuff with a subframe, and uh, it's hard to put like a 30 inch tire on the on the Forester. Now that being said, like my Rav4, I've got 31s on. But the RAV4 does not drive as well as a Forester. The RAV4 is not as confident on the road as a Forester. So there's kind of trade-offs there, um, at least in my opinion. The Forester just feels more reassuring. I don't know if it's the all-wheel drive system, but to me, it just it's a better handling or more confident assuring drive in the Forester. Um, yeah, as far as off-road goodies, it's very similar to what we've seen on the 
Outback. I like the gold accents that they've done. They haven't. They didn't it's, do the. It's very the, minimal on this. It's more minimal. It's a better look. the The roof racks got a little bit. The roof racks are beefed up. Yep. To handle more weight for camping. Uh, so it's cool that they hey drawing attention to that that we've we've changed something there, but they lost those two chunky, random gold bits on the the front of the outback. Right. Um, that was to showcase like the uh, the anchor points for mm-hmm. the, the tow hitch or not the tow hitch tow eye. The hooks. I yeah. But yeah, there's cool you don't get that. LED fog lights. It's got that kind of uh, the pattern, machine yeah. gun or what? Did, what did you call those back in the, when the when retrofits were a big deal? Did oh, that. the this almost looks like the Q forty five headlight yeah, yeah. retrofit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a it's a cool look. Um, blue. I don't know if blue is my ideal color for this. I don't know what you're talking about. Spec. Subarus only come in blue. In yeah. my books, anyways, there should be a big gold five 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 right next to on the. Yeah, on the it side should have panel. gold wheels too. Like, oh yeah, the black doesn't. Black wheels don't really make sense for off road. No, they don't. I hate they black just wheels. Get, gloss black, like <laughs> it just it just gets scratched up. Yeah, um, it doesn't really make sense for this type of vehicle. No, it doesn't. I um, hate. I hate gloss black wheels. Yeah. Every you either do time... bronze <laughs> to match the 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 accents on this car, or you can do even a gunmetal, um, just for low maintenance. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what they silver do. kind of dorky, so yeah. But yeah. that's really it. Unfortunately, the f- oh, actually, one more thing. Um, it's rated worse for fuel economy than a regular Forester, because probably the tire as well as that aerodynamics, <laughs> like all that comes weight. Into play. Yeah, different yeah. tires, different more skid plates. So it there's more weight on this one. Yeah, and the gearing is not as good. I'm just gonna be time. honest. I'm upset that it's not the turbo. Yeah, because they do, they do it, so it's not like they couldn't. Um, like it, I'm sure it fits. Yeah, I'm sure this it is fits. a very underpowered feeling car for off roading though. It's fine, but for your day to day, it doesn't make sense because this, yeah, the trade off like if you compare it to a CRV that has very similar power figures. Having a little turbo, it just gives it that more pep. I feel like that yeah. it's a better drive for that car. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's move on from that. Let's talk about Hyundai. Hyundai released something for the Korean market. It's called yeah. the Casper. It's so charming. It's the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. I love it. Um, it's a subcompact or even smaller than a subcompact little SUV. Um, it looks like it's the size of a mini, but except it has a higher roof line. Um, there's, there's literally no information on this, but um, from what I can gather, it's most likely going to be uh, a gasoline powered vehicle, potentially diesel in some markets. There may be an electric variant as well, but it's such a cute little car. The front end, the headlights, they look like eyes. They just they it's very mini-esque, except it's taller. And it's a Hyundai, which means that you won't have those reliability issues that you might run into like a mini would. And it's gonna be a third of the price of a Mini Cooper countryman, whatever you want to call it these days. Yeah, it looks to be very small, and they've they've kept with the Hyundai theme, right? They still have that extra set of headlights. Uh, higher up, kind of like what the the Kona and the not the Juke, but the well, their the thing that looks they, like a Juke. The, the they have it on the, the venue. venue. They the have venue. it on the they they have it on all their cars. The yeah. divorce headlight. But yeah, I, I th- it looks okay. Uh, I, I think no, on this car. No, I don't think it looks okay. It looks great. I don't care what you say. You're changing your mind. Okay, because it's draw. Okay. So we've seen this type of front end very recently. So in Hyundai's animation, they're pulling back the curtains on it. They don't show you that second headlight head on when they reveal it because the character comes from that grill and the headlights, which we've seen recently on the Honda E. Yeah. yeah. And the Honda E doesn't have that extra set of headlights and it looks better. 
I, I think the top, they're actually turn signals. Yeah, or I, I don't know what they are, but it kind of, it doesn't match the cute aesthetic, I think. It gives it that angrier Kia Soul look, the new Kia Soul that looks like a disgruntled Range Rover. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of a Stormtrooper every time I see a Soul in white. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's all it is. It looks like... I don't know how I feel about the upper, the grill, that whole fascia, the upper it's portion. A little bit of black posse dip and you're good to go. It's blacked out already. I can't well, black out the turn signals. Why not? <laughs> I tint my turn signals so they work less. <laughs> hashtag. Um, There's repeaters on the mirror. All right. I still like the look it's of fine. this car, but I think that's, you know, I've talked about it before. It's the Hyundai the inconsistency with their design and the the oh. fact that they don't kind of carry on you know yeah. design this, cues from this model looks to model. nothing like any of their products <laughs> yeah, it looks kind of like the top half of a kia soul which isn't there, even a hyundai <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> there definitely doesn't look like uh their own product um but i think yeah you know that's not a Bad if thing. there was no... no Hyundai badge on it, and you told me this is the best-selling Chinese EV in certain oh, markets. Oh, yeah, that's I absolutely right? believe that. The yeah. size and the, the look and how wild it looks. <laughs> it's not a bad look, but it just it doesn't scream Hyundai. And it's like, I think as a brand, I've said it time and time again, is that you need to work on branding. And, you know, obviously in the domestic market, they've got that cornered pretty well but you know what other card reminds you of the trailblazer the, the mm, new one the, the new, new trailblazer one? The yeah Daewoo. the one that hasn't been selling at all and no one wants it yeah you know i drove <laughs> one recently a customer brought one in i really how, how liked it? it really it's it's quite nice it's it like it's like a hyundai actually <laughs> well, it's it's very uh it's very korean there's nothing there's nothing chevy about it um because it wasn't made for the North American it wasn't. market. It's, I think they're probably even made in Korea. But it's a very handsome car, I think. You know, given the size and it's the trunk space was really good for how small it was. Uh, maybe I've just been, maybe my bar is set quite low, but I thought it was like the right size vehicle. I feel like I could live with this size of vehicle. I just don't like the name. Because, okay, I guess I'm thinking Chevy Trax. And the Chevy Trax was kind Trax of garbage. Was, well, you don't have to be that nice. It was hot garbage. <laughs> there and you go. this one is such an upgrade from that. It <laughs> looks way better inside and out. Great materials for the price point. Um, yeah, I, I thought that thing was quite yeah. charming. 25 uh, to 30K, roughly. 25 Canadian. is not expensive these days. No, it's not bad. Pricing wise, yeah. it's definitely not bad for a subcompact SUV. And that's MSRP. It's a yeah, Chevy. Chevy. That you can hopefully get a is the Chevy. Yeah, that is the Chevy appeal is that MSRP is just a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But their uh, their their finance at lease rates are absolutely true. Like just horrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um. That I would not mind that car either, but yeah, no, the the Casper, cute name, cute car, but it it miss it misses for me in terms of branding for Hyundai, and I think it looks angry on top and and cheerful really on the bottom, cheerful and happy on the bottom, yeah, right. It doesn't. <laughs> the more I look at it, the more disconnected it looks like. It looks like two different cars. It it's definitely different. Um, I I'm in love with it because I love how cute it looks. Uh, yeah. But it's it's not going to be a practical vehicle, and it's not going to come here to North America. So it doesn't really matter what I think. But mm -hmm. what is going to come to North America? Hopefully, is well, no, this is coming. This well, I mean, as long as they can keep making them, yeah. um, is the Mercedes AMG GT. 63 S four door E performance. So uh, a little while ago, uh, Mercedes has 
developed this whole like drivetrain, how they have paired a, a two liter with like the EQ system, as well as the four liter with the EQ system. And that's exactly what this is. It's a four liter twin turbo V6, sorry, V8, sorry, with an EQ system. But unlike the kind of current EQ system that you can get in like the E53, CLS 53, or whatever other 53 vehicles, um, that's a mild hybrid that helps you kind of get going a little bit. And that's really it. This is a full blown plug-in hybrid. Um, so let's talk specs first. This is the most powerful production Mercedes AMG vehicle ever. A total of 831 horsepower Ooh. and 1,032 pound feet of torque. Yeah. That, that's a stupendous amount of power. The rear electrical motor is connected to a two-speed gearbox, so it's still able to assist and push at different speeds. It's a maximum of 201 peak horsepower, a 93 horsepower continuous output. This is designed for maximum performance. Like a lot of people, okay, plug-in hybrid, you're thinking... Honda Clarity, uh, Toyota RAV4 Prime. Those are going to be more economy-minded plug-in hybrids. Mm -hmm. Maximum range. This has very, very little range. 12 kilometers. 12 of, whopping kilometers. Of pure electrical range. And this is purely because the battery is designed for just that immediacy, that big burst of power. Mm -hmm. Because 0 to 100 comes in under three seconds, 2.9. Zero to 200 kilometers per hour in under 10 seconds. Top speed of 196. This is amazing. It, yeah, it, it's it so is crazy. You know, the, the most obvious competitor, I think, is probably the Panamera Turbo S E hybrid, which has just under 700 horsepower, I think, combined. And so that's so far off, you know, an extra 100 horsepower. Uh, the, the Panamera has about just under 30 Ks of range. But I think even considering this only has about 12 kilometers of pure electric range, I don't even think that's a problem. I think for those people that want to take advantage of the EV mode, let's say you do want that, you if you're affording a six-figure, probably close to $200,000 sports four-door, you probably live not out in the middle of nowhere, right? Probably Where not. 12 kilometers is actually like probably pretty normal. Uh, <laughs> what you could expect to use out of it. Like, you know, it would cover a lot of people that in this demographic, it, it might make sense. Um, but like you said, it's not what it's meant for. It's not meant for saving you gas. It's not meant for, for commuting on electric mode only, even though it can. Um, the, the AMG GT has already earned its right in terms of just how good of a performance car it is. Um, the lap times, the reviews, everyone raves about this car uh, because it's not the CLS. Um, it's not the, the E63. It is an Based AMG. On it. It's the exact same I, underpinnings. It's 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 got more there, AMG there's changes. in there's, its DNA. There's, there's definitely more changes to it to make it better, but the underpinnings, it's actually the same chassis as an E as well as a CLS. Yeah, it's that same size. Um, but it's they've gotten pushed it a lot more. Um, whereas we so for so long we've just been seeing okay, they just shove the the, the, the hot engine into an E-Class and they call it a day, maybe slap some carbon ceramics on it. But from overall, the AMG seems to be more like a thorough engineering of a uh, sports sedan. So mm -hmm. in that segment, they have those three offerings. You know, one is your... Actually, I don't even know why the CLS exists anymore, to be honest. It's, it's a lower price version of the AMG GT. Basically, that's, it, that's it, basically. It, okay, <laughs> kind of looks better. This new CLS is is very attractive. I will give it that. 
Yeah. I think the rear on this is a little bit awkward because it has kind of that Panamera look, which is not the coupe. Yeah, it's not the same coupe look as the CLS. The CLS is, I think, a prettier, prettier car. Um, but that's literally. Then again, that's always been the reason for the CLS's existence. Yeah. Right. Um, can we talk about the most unfortunate thing on this vehicle? How long the name is? Oh, the no, charger. The charge port. Um, it's there, in the. N- it's in the butt. <laughs> there's no better say this. There's no better way to. It say looks this. like a black eggplant is. Uh, it has it has a bum plug. Um, has... <laughs> the electrical charging port is right beneath the passenger side tail light, and it's a very unfortunate place for it. It it's just a start of all jokes. Um, but not only that. It means you have to back it up to charge it. Um, here in North America, I found out that not a lot of people like backing up their vehicles. Even the to... ones that do it themselves. <laughs> Which this car probably will. <laughs> it, it can, but people like to just go right in through the front. And if your plug is in the back, you're draping that cable over the body of the vehicle, or on the side of the vehicle. <laughs> you think people will do that? Go front into a charge port? Absolutely. I've seen people do yeah. that. All the oh. time, like Tesla charge, like plugs are all the way back. I've seen tons of people go front in and have that cable drape across the side Ooh. over the top of the vehicle to charge. Like it doesn't make sense to me, but people do it, and that's exactly what's going to happen here. So above the fact that it looks like it's a bum plug, which it is because it's a plug right on the bum of the vehicle, people are going to damage their own vehicle as they're charging this. But eh, who's really charging this outside? I don't think people are going to be that much. Mm. It's probably going to be charging at a home mostly. And that's really yeah. it. Yeah, or just don't charge it. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about styling changes. Because there are almost none. <laughs> the The front end of the lower bumper, the lower fascia, has been revised a little bit. Uh, there's little E badges on the front fenders where it says E performance. Um, the S on the rear hatch is now red. Of course, we got that bum plug port on the rear, and that's it for external changes. Um, there's different wheels, of course, but I mean, most people can't tell from that. Oh, you can get carbon ceramics, which is uh, which is nice. But- and you get the hideous AMG monoblocks. That's always been the question. In the last few episodes of the Kicking Tires podcast, that has been um, can you the get topic the, of debate. Can it's, you get the MG monoblocks on this? I, I hope to God not. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, the, the wheels in the press photos, they're actually really funky. Um, they're a split five-spoke design, but on the outer edge, it looks like it has Saturn rings around it. Um, I saw this it... um, recently on a C63. Oh, really? Just yesterday. There was one parked right outside my place, and it had a ring inside, like the N- oh. like the NKNT03s. Oh. And I was like... That's weird. I thought, I was like, did they always have this? Oh. Huh. And uh, yeah, so that was... Was it, a, was it a newer C63? Yeah, it must have been a 20 or 21. Huh. Um, it was wrapped like a teal color, but... Huh. Um, yeah, I'm just going to see if the 63S, you can get the monoblocks on them. So chances are you can get the monoblocks on the E-Performance. It is uh, quite, <laughs> it just ruins the whole lines of the car. <sighs> I guess you can get monoblocks. Yeah, it, it's it's rough. Like, But I guess they're, they're allowing this on all of their models. Um, I... Yeah. Well, it's only just... available on the... <laughs> <laughs> I just put a picture. I, I can't... Uh, you know what? I don't know I... how you e- extract it. Here, let me let me do this. Uh, AMG GT Mono Block. Let me see if I can find it from that. Yep. There's, oh, there you go. There's, there's billions of photos already. It's... Yeah. 
And you know what? The fan. Oh my god, that is so ugly. Oh, that's in Chrome too. That's great. Oh. Look at the white one. Oh, Oof. they're so big too. Like the tires are so low profile. Uh, these ones are twenty ones. Twenty ones. Oh, okay. So slightly smaller than the uh, the GLS ones. GLS. You know yeah. what? People is gonna do. People are gonna buy the GLS ones and gonna put it on this. Go twenty three monoblocks. Just wait, if, you're gonna see it one day. Yeah, if there's one thing that makes this wheel uglier, it's a low profile <laughs> tire. <laughs> yeah, as oh, if this... it could get any uglier. But yeah, so there is uh, the question answered. In case you're wondering, they do make a monoblock <laughs> application for this car. Oh, that's horrible. Oh. Uh, other than the wheels, I think the overall who, who the car sees looks good. like the the wheel on this press car and goes, you know what? I'd rather have the mono blocks, like, and I'll pay two grand for them. It's okay, a, it's a fifteen hundred dollar so option. I I was curious, you know, how much people love or dislike the mono blocks. So I actually posted that question on um, on Reddit like two three weeks back. It was actually quite split. Like it was a good 50-50 of people yeah. that were on there that I'm not loved even surprised. Um because they're wrong, but I'm not so... <laughs> I like there's some people that love the heritage of it, which don't mind how they look. But if you love the heritage, you would probably also hate it because they're not the right size for the vehicle. Exactly. Like yeah. the AMG, the classic AMG monoblock with the deep dish. Uh, with a fatter tire, it is very nice, you know, on a uh, like a 190e, 124. Yeah, like yeah. those are nice. Or yeah. uh, or what a 500e. Um, yeah, yeah, the 500es with the monoblocks. I think it's the, perfect. Like it's like a three three piece monoblock. They look so good, yeah. but. <laughs> the AMG GT, that white one right there, is just awful, awful, <laughs> awful. Especially, I, I don't even get why it, they call it the mono. Like it, it's just, it just does a disservice to that name. But well, I mean, <sighs> technically, most wheels are monoblock, right? <laughs> exactly. Like it's not even, not even that impressive that it's a monoblock. Yeah, I this white AMG GT with chrome monoblocks. Um, if you are listening in search it on google white amg gt monoblock you'll be able to see it it's uh it's something tell me tell me how you feel about it message me on instagram yeah. tell me Maybe how you we'll feel story about it. this one and then we'll, we'll do a poll <laughs> there's a I, dog licking I me right now. i don't think i can <laughs> i don't think i can post this on my instagram story without uh without it breaking my phone it's that pretty of a vehicle mm. um all right, that's enough of talking about AMG. Let's talk about the CX-5. How many times have you reviewed the CX-5? I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so <laughs> I've reviewed it a few times. This is All a 21.5? Right. This is a 21.5 in Canada or 21 in the US. They updated the infotainment system. It's the same one that's in the Mazda 3 or the Mazda CX-30 now. Mm. So it's a wider screen. It's faster. It works better. Uh, but you don't get wireless Apple CarPlay anymore. Um, you have that. Look, I know. I, it's crazy. You have to plug it in. There's a thing called a wire. It's super old school. Um, but <laughs> yeah, that's really the only change. And that's really it. I mean, the CX-5, it's going to yeah. have a big refresh in two years, I'm thinking. Not the 2022 model year, but 2023. I think that's when it's going to be uh, the next CX-5. Yeah, because with this generation, it was more of a, a style update. It was a me. style update, but they also refresh a lot of the stuff on the inside, and they yeah. put in a lot more sound mm. deadening within the vehicle mm. to help it just be quieter and be more upscale. And nice. you definitely do hear the difference. Like the first CX-5 versus this, it's worlds apart on how they drive, as well as just how loud the interior is. Um, and within like the wheel arches, you can see on this current CX-5 that like they put that felt lining on there. 
rather than the regular plastic. So that way it's absorbed some of that sound a little bit more. So they thought of things like that to help. I don't know. I still think the CX-5 is a very pretty vehicle. I don't have any problems with it. It's a little small, um, especially the back seat and the trunk area compared to other compact or mid-sized, depending on what you consider it as, yeah. um, SUVs. Because like the Forester is bigger. The RAV4 is slightly bigger. The CRV is huge. Uh, same thing with the Nissan Rogue, also huge. Yeah. <laughs> um, the CX-5 is... Like, you said this best. Like, there's really no reason why Mazda has to make their vehicles smaller. You said this, I think, like a year ago mm -hmm. when we were talking about it. There's literally no reason why Mazda has not makes their vehicles smaller. It, the compromise on making it smaller, making it lighter, to have a better driving feel, sure, it pays dividends to maybe a few people. But to most, they honestly wouldn't care. Yeah, no, and the, the what I mean by there, there being no reason is that giving you a slightly larger trunk does not make the car inherently worse to drive. Like, I, I don't know, like all of the length, the real estate on this car is on the hood. Like, <laughs> there's there's quite a bit of space between the front of the engine yeah. and the front of the bumper. There There is a lot of hood space, but because of the turbo motor that they kind of are using that space now. Um, with the regular two and a half, just the naturally aspirated version, yeah. they weren't. Um, yeah, actually, like I'm looking know? at you sitting in the back of it, and it's just like, that's just enough. It's it's sufficient. It's, yeah. it's not great back there by any means, but it's sufficient. But that's why they make the CX-8 as well as the CX-9. Uh, CX-8 is uh, Japan and actually most of Asia models. Uh, whereas CX-9 is a North America or a uh, Canada, US model. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, like and, I said, but you still have the same problem, which is like, it's still a fraction of the size of a pilot. Yeah, the CX-9 and, is like, it's bigger than the CX-5, which is perfect, but it's so much smaller than like a Honda Pilot. Then you're like, why? <laughs> again, it's like, why again? It's, yeah, that, that baby seat is right up against you. Yeah, um, fitting child seats in here is definitely a little bit more of a struggle. There isn't as much space as I personally would like. Yeah. Um, putting three people in here, fine. Uh, yeah. Four, struggle. Uh, three, yeah. with stroller, and then you go to Costco, not applicable, because you're, you're not going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so here's the thing for me, is that I, look, I do care how a car drives, but interior materials that's something that like the first few months of owning a car it kind of matters but then it kind of eventually it just becomes neither here nor there if that's your your daily commuter vehicle eventually it just becomes that and i don't really care that you know the dash upper trim is so much nicer than anything else on the market i would right? disagree with you so I had a CX-3 before. The CX-3 is nowhere near as nice as this. And it was a base model CX-3. And it was even more of a compromise in terms of space. Yeah, <laughs> it was really bad. The HRV is so much bigger than the CX-3. But I got a good deal on it. Anyways, the CX-3, I went from that, uh, a 2016 CX-3 to a 2010 CRV, And like, you're talking about the materials on like the upper dash and stuff. Like the CX-3 wasn't great. Like it had padded like upper door panels and whatnot, but the rest of it was quite plasticky. But the CRV, I sat in that and it's like everything is this plastic. It's mm -hmm. bad all over. Um, and like, it's not only this, the, the quality of the plastic, but how everything feels. Like it's super scratchy. Um, yeah. it, but I like, think given like the contemporary, like you got to go rogue, like a 2021 rogue, or 2021, I don't know. But yeah, if you go Rogue versus a CX-5 2021, you're not going to go into a Rogue and be like, this is disgusting. It's okay. not as nice as this. The, we, you know, some things are not as nice. We can't really compare the Rogue because the Rogue is really good. If we say yeah. the CRV, let's say the CRV. I'm okay with that one. The CRV has good parts, but yeah. there are parts that like it's, they have this, this stitching that's on here on the, the dash. 
as well as like that it won't matter console. after two months of owning it. You but like not, it's it will not bother you. I, just knowing that it's fake stitching bothers me. But you know what does bother you is that the, the child seat pushing up against your headrest is that's what bothers you. The, that's the fine. fact that you go grocery shopping and then you're like, ah, oh, crap. That's what will bother you. In the <laughs> long run, these things are what matters. That's, that's when the car is CX8 four or five years nine. old, you don't care about the interior materials anymore. And that's why it's... you buy a CX9. <laughs> So that that's kind of where I still stand with Mazda and all, like all of their products is like you're investing in something that is not fundamental to my use or you know the purpose of the vehicle. Um, you're you're honestly you're not wrong. A CX five, it's a very good car. If your kids are a little yeah. bit older, they don't need child seats. They don't need a stroller. It's fine. Yeah, but like when that younger... tweeter grill is so nice. Oh, the the like, boast around, yeah. Like it looks so much nicer than anything else in this class. But does it matter, or is it going to? Yes. You know, if you own this thing long term, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't move the needle, and that's that's the problem. Is that you're investing in a tweeter grill when you really should be giving me, you know, a little bit more leg room, a little bit more headroom. Well, you know, let's focus hope on next... fuel economy. <laughs> yeah, also not great point, um, but we'll skip over that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the next CX-5, Mazda is going to learn a lot from this, uh, but Mazda is also going upscale, right? They're no longer hitting the, the Toyota, Maz, or, sorry, mm-hmm. Toyota, Nissan, Honda market. They're trying to aim for luxury markets. And on their previous press event, when they sent us a CX-30, they were comparing their CX-30 against Mercedes GLA, BMW X1. Like they're comparing high-end brands. And when you do compare those high-end brands with a lot of the later Mazas, you're getting similar interior information and like details and everything, except you just get it at a much lower price point. Mm-hmm. But I think the people that are buying those like kind they of- buy base- it for the brand. Exactly. That's that's the problem. But there are still people buying it because they want an entry level luxury vehicle. And if they're not buying it for the brand, for those that aren't, Mazda is a really good step because you're getting those like luxury appointments, but not that luxury price and the stupid dealer fees that you're going to be paying at a typical Mercedes BMW dealership. It's going to be cheaper to repair your Mazda than it is a, uh, a Mercedes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, we got a little bit of time. I know you said you had a little rant. Oh, yeah. I think, um, where should we go back? Should we go back to uh, the Corolla? Corolla. Let me, let me Corolla, yeah. Up. So we were talking about the Corolla a little bit. Um, you know, the Corolla is one of these perpetual best-selling vehicles you know for decades it's it's um i I guess the i don't even know where to begin with this car is the corolla does not do anything exceptional we talked about this earlier and it's like it um none of the the refinement the power the fuel economy the interior materials there's nothing that it does better than its competition like nothing. I can't think of one objective measurement of a brand new vehicle that would make you really choose that over another. Uh, and even the lease rates are not that good um, from what I know. Where we're going with that is um, kind of Stellantis just released uh, a new, idea, you know, going to another automotive giant. We have the 2021 initial quality survey uh, from JD Power. JD Power initial quality survey is basically talking about the um, within the first three months, basically uh, the amount of issues cars have, and if your your car scores well in those surveys, then you rank high. Now, this time around, it's a bit of a surprise because 
we're seeing Stellantis models get onto the JD Power I IQS uh, ranking pretty high on there. Um, and it's not just the tr Charger and the 300, which are ancient models. They've been around for a decade, if not longer. Uh, even the new RAM is doing very well for initial quality. And I think that's where Toyota, it, you know, they've been like, Toyotas don't really break down either. But, um, you know, initial quality, a lot of it is just talking about the customer's complaints with this vehicle. Uh, so as long as either the customer doesn't report an issue or, um, or obviously if the car doesn't have any issues, then the car will score well. Um, Toyota always does quite well. Um, yeah, where I was going with this is that initial quality is not really why you buy a Toyota. It's it's really not the 30 days, but the so the problem with cars like the Ram is that you can buy a Ram 1500 Eco Diesel. It's not going to last more than four years. The engine will. It's not when it's like it's not a matter of will it blow up. It's just really when it will blow up because the eco diesel is fundamentally flawed. So if you get a Grand Cherokee a Ram with that eco diesel motor, you're welcome to buy it. It will score well in IQS. Doesn't mean uh, anything in the long term. That's kind of where a car like the Corolla will pretty much outperform anything. But yeah, yeah shockingly enough, um, that, yeah, that's kind of the news that came out this week is that the Ram trucks are leading uh, IQS. So I just want to call out JD Power for having one of the most meaningless studies <laughs> in the seg or in the whole automotive landscape because Ram is probably quite easily the worst. Um, <laughs> I think out of out of the big three trucks, Ram. I don't know. Long term reliability wise, they're they're pretty they're pretty terrible. Uh, Lexus is number three, so it goes Ram, Dodge, and then Lexus. So Ram and Dodge are ahead of Lexus for IQS. Um, Toyota is not even in there. Toyota is like twelfth or something like that. Ram is ahead of Toyota. That's how you know this initial quality means nothing. There's also a few other things like you got to consider how many models there are um when dodge is sending out these surveys or when jd power is sending out these surveys to dodge owners it's charger challengers and durangles that's it for dodge mm -hmm. um for ram it's the 1500 2500 3500 they also like the ram wagon um, pro master the pro master but like yeah. that's towards uh fleet and i don't think this counts for fleet. Yeah, so Toyota is basically average now. That's how, you know, Toyota and Ford are, are basically at the average, the midpoint. Uh, Lexus is high up there, obviously. But um, yeah, so I, I think when you go to it, I guess the thing to note is when you see an ad for a car or you go into a dealership and you see them bragging about their JD Power Award, just know that that means nothing. That doesn't mean your car is going to hold up well. That doesn't mean uh, it's going to have good resale value because after four years, when that engine blows up, it it doesn't. It's not going to be worth anything because it doesn't run. At least um, the initial, um, yeah, reliability. Yeah, because in the first three months, because what what's going to plague these cars is when these manufacturers update their infotainment system, you're going to get a lot of bugs. And eventually they iron out the kinks with those things. But in those first three months, it's going to be frustrating as heck. Um, what else? Yeah, but I mean, that's that's really, I don't know. It, it's really important that you just take reviews and surveys with a grain of salt. Like like these these surveys, as objective as they seem, you know, it's not... I'm not saying there's a bias within JD Power, but it's just like, it seems like it's something that was just fabricated to give auto manufacturers something to put on their mantle. 
right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's what it feels like. And you know what's hilarious? Ram and Lexus, or no, Ram and Dodge, number one and number two. Guess what's in last place? Chrysler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how how ironic is that? You took you took home both first and last place, making the same car. <laughs> Chrysler only sells Pacifica and three hundred. I didn't know they were having problems with the Pacifica. Yeah, it's not the three hundred doing it because the three hundred is over ten years old. Yeah. Um. So it's the Pacifica definitely causing uh, a bit of grief, I guess, especially. You know, it's again, it's reported issue. So maybe there's a lot of mommy bloggers that ended up with a Pacifica and are now complaining about it. Um, whereas people with a Ram 3500, maybe not so picky about maybe. things. Um, so yeah, again, it's so meaningless because guess what? These cars are going to be built the same. They're going to last roughly the same amount of time. A Dodge and a Chrysler, a Dodge is not going to significantly outlast a Chrysler. Um, but yeah, that's how ironic this, this study is because mm -hmm. they've taken first and last place. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely odd. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't say much to this. Most of the cars that like all the cars that I get, they're all brand new models with less than 10,000 on the, on the clock. Mm -hmm. So rarely it, have issues. Right? The, I, I really don't have any issues with any vehicles. Land Rover. Um, the <laughs> only <laughs> time I had issues was with Land Rover infotainment. Uh, actually, turn I did signals. Have, yeah, the turn signal. There, I I give an okay to that one um, because that um, turn signal issue that car was used in Grand Tour, um, oh. and as you saw in Grand Tour, it was it was beaten quite hard. It. Um, so I don't, I don't blame the turn signals as much, but the infotainment, that's different. Um, but I mean, with every single manufacturer, I recall every single infotainment restarting while I'm driving. Um, it's one of those things that's just normal now because the infotainment itself is working on its own operating system. It happens. Mm -hmm. It's normal. I don't think it's any different than, you know, just a computer that needs to be restarted every now and then. It's fine. Yeah. That, Did you that's try I, turning it on and off? Yeah, first yeah. thing I've done. Yeah, you used to work in IT and yeah, Still dealing with end users. Yep. Yeah, and so yeah, <laughs> it's normal. Yeah. In any case, I think that's really it. Good place for us to end here for today's uh, little episode of Kicking Tires, and we'll see everyone next week. Catch you next week. <laughs>